Who was my place right time? When I got to New York after grad school, it was early um, 73, and all those uh, conventions over at uh, 42nd Street. Um, like suling cons and stuff? Yeah, those were fun. I'd go over there to those things. See, I don't think I knew you went to those. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and those were the days where you'd see um, like 12 year old kids with briefcases full of cash. They <laughs> were flipping. <laughs> They would just they had they'd open up and they they cash and they buy you know uh, all kinds of things you know and Bob King was over there from selling Batman sketches for for ten dollars that other people had done. <laughs> <laughs> well, he actually used to do it. You could get a real Bob King. Yeah, he was like he was like that kid in high school that could uh, the the boy who could just draw the M sixteen gun or or the exactly. boy who could just draw the horse. It's the right. same it's one. The thing with the, the ears. <laughs> So we're here with Tom DeHaven, uh, author of Funny Pages, the Derby Dugan Trilogy, um, the Superman novel. It's Superman. Yeah. Um, you have experience as both writer, novelist, but a lot of experience that crosses over into comics, which is part of how you've kind of gotten onto our radar. Yeah. So very excited to uh, sit down with you here today. And Thanks. Thanks. thought we would talk about some of your history with comics. And you mentioned... You know, being in New York in 1973, going to shows and starting to participate at that point. Um, can you talk about your history with comics? And yeah, well, I mean, I grew up with. Uh, I I um I grew up with uh, again fortunate. I was I I was you know buying you know um, the Flash, the first Flash um, showcase, and the first Green Lantern. You know, and Adam and all those Silver Age books. I was young enough to you know with my dime and. Justice League of America. I can still remember where I bought those comic books, what stores, and things. So, I then the, the you know the first Fantastic Four and all that stuff. So I, it was the right. I was the perfect age to uh, become you know infatuated by by that stuff and still being you know cannibalized today for movies and all that other kind. So was it newsstand or was it drugstores or it was, combination it was, of? Uh, I lived in Bayonne, New Jersey, uh, and there'd be candy like candy stores. Candy stores, yeah, wow! Candy stores. Like there'd be one on the Boulevard and one on Avenue C, and you know you pass this one on your way to school, you know, and, you, and Tuesdays and Wednesdays were comic days, um, both days, and uh, then this was other when I'd go uh, uh, visiting friends on the other side of town. So, so you know, I, I bought I guess about fifteen twenty comics a week, but they were still ten cents and, and twelve cents. And, so uh, and then I got really interested in newspaper comic strips very early on. Um, so uh, from very early age, I I um, I'd go to the library, the Bound Public Library, and, and they were you know those old books like the comics uh, and uh, comic art in America, and reading about cartoonists, and uh, I became fascinated. And, you know, I wanted to be a cartoonist and started drawing my own comic strips and comic books. And so I was completely, uh, uh, totally taken up by my comics for a long time. Um, my bedroom wall was, was, I would take the Sunday comics every week and I'd cut my favorites and tape them up on the wall. I was, uh, it was nice that I had a, a terrific mother who just thought, all right, that's what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, you know, I would change the comic strips out all the time. So yeah, I was totally enamored of it. So I wanted to be a, a cartoonist, and my problem was was um, I drew and wrote my comic books and comic strips all the way through uh, um, you know high school. I was the high school um, cartoonist for my newspaper when George R. R. Martin was the editor of the school paper. So uh, it kind of passed in the night. But I, there was came a time when I realized, you no, know, I. I'm getting better at being a writer than I am drawing. And I realized after a while, I think my problem was I don't have a very good depth perception. <laughs> I, could, I could never do I could never do certain kinds of drawings. I just couldn't do them. So I thought, well, I, I wanted to do semi-realistic kind of cartooning rather than, you know, cartoony cartooning. So I couldn't do it. So I basically... Um, were there some writing, specific yeah. scripts or, or comic books that you sort of wanted to do? Well, I loved Dick Tracy. You know, I, I, I loved, you know, I loved uh, um, uh, the kind of 
cartoon boy cranes kind of drawing. It's kind of it's realistic, but it's cartoony and stretched and exaggerated, but not it's it's not totally exaggerated. You know, I, I like the same kind of cartoon that Crumb like, you know, the thirties uh, kind of style. It's it's you know, big foot, but it's you know, it's also recognizably real. This the, the you know, um, um, everything, the backgrounds, etc., are cartoony but realistic, and I couldn't do it, um, so I dropped out. Do you have any recollection of how you got some of your your first kind of secondhand comics? Uh, was there bookstores that had little comic book sections? Uh, this, you know, this there used per- to be uh, second. There used to be bookstores, you know, um, secondhand bookstores where um, in the back there'd be comic books, and they, you could get back issues of comic books. So, and I was fascinated always by getting like, you know, comic books from a year before I started. It was like the Stone Age, you know. <laughs> God, there was a, there was a book from 1956, you know, and it just seemed to me like it was a thousand years ago. Uh, and you get those like two for a quarter. So I used to get that. And was that in Bayonne as well? Or? It was in Bayonne. Okay. Uh, sometimes, you know, Jersey City, um, but mostly in Bayonne. You mentioned your mother was very supportive of yeah. your interest in comics. This would have been, I guess, late 50s and into the 60s. So was there like public uh, backlash against comics? I mean, this is following, I guess, Comics Code and the Senate hearings. And- it was funny. I read about that stuff, you know, obviously, you know. Uh, um, but I don't, I don't remember. I was kind of the oddball kid. I mean, uh, that, you know, people would come over to my house. Kids would come over to my house because I'd have all the comic books, you know. But, <laughs> but my friends had comic books, too, with it. I had just a lot more of them. You know, uh, but uh, and I don't remember parents like burning them or taking them. Or, uh, it's not that this was a, a most enlightened, you know, this was Bay of New Jersey. We were all lower class, you know, Roman Catholics, you know, Polish, Irish, Italian, you know, but no one seemed to uh, burn them. You know? <laughs> and my mother never seemed to care about it. But it might have been a, right, I mean, that stuff happened in 53, 54, right? I was. So I was with the Comics Code Authority, so I guess my mother said, oh, it's okay with the Comics Code Authority, it's okay with me. <laughs> you said that writing became a, 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 sh- a stronger focus th- than the art part. Did you participate in fandom uh, early on in any way, like uh, writing for fanzines or letters columns? He- no, well, actually, uh, Gary Panter uh, sent me, must be 10 years ago or more, Gary had his big comic book collection, and uh, he was going through it at one point to kind of put things in order. And he found a comic book, and he was going through this one of those uh, American comics group when they turned to superheroes, when they did like Kurt Schattenberger and did some of these comic uh, superhero strips. And he was flipping through it, and there was a long letter from me. <laughs> <laughs> they used to put your address in the bottom, which is, is inconceivable now. Right. So he sent me the comic book, and I said, You know, I never saw this. <laughs> I never knew it was That's published. Awesome. I must have missed that issue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I used to write to, you know, um, and uh, write to comic books and you know, that kind of stuff. But I, I, uh, I would see some fanzines, but I never did one um, or published any fan art or I wish I had. I wish I knew more about that because I sure had a lot of stuff that I was drawing. I could have set them on. You, you know, you started out, you were talking about you get to New York and you're going to like 42nd Street in the 70s. That's kind of a mythic place outside of comics. Yeah. You know, like I'm interested in exploitation movies and things, and you know, it's a very legendary. You really talk to me then because that was my first job. <laughs> oh, yeah. I work for the men's magazines. I, I, uh, yeah, when I got out of graduate school, you know, uh, I um, started writing for uh, Soho Weekly News and the Daily Planet, which was a, a weekly newspaper in the Village Voice, and anything I could do. And I got a job working for uh, Lopez Publications, which was on 26th Street. They had all kinds of about 30 magazines, women's magazines, sports magazines. And I, I got a job as an associate editor, assistant editor on. Um, Sir, Mister, and Man to Man, which are three men's magazines. And uh, I was basically editing, just like I'd be editing anything else, editing manuscripts and sizing photographs and writing photo captions. It was, I loved it, loved the job. And, uh, um, but it's also then, boom, comes uh, Deep Throat and Behind the Green Door. And, and I was sent out to write articles about these people. And, uh, I got to know, you know, the porn, the porn gang, all those, those people. 
It's not that I used to go to these parties, you know, and go to the, the porn stores, but actually they were just like regular people, you know, just um, hung out with them. Um, so I was writing about that when I was writing my first um, novel, and uh, in fact, Big Zamora, which is kind of a comic book type novel, very much like you know, mutants and things like that, started out as a novel about porn people, uh, and then kind of morphed into this uh, novel about uh, you know, mutants who do a porn show. So that's, that's the background they had for that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was okay. The seventies, you know, I, I haven't seen that show on HBO. I saw a couple of episodes of uh, the Deuce, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the the um, world that I, uh, as a, as my you know first years grown up, came into after graduate school. That was so very, very familiar to me. Grow, grow quick in that uh, in that environment for sure. What's that? You you grow up quick in that environment. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. But you know the funny thing was, and I talked about this. It, it, they were very nice people. You know, I would. There were. Uh, I know we need to talk about comments, but you know, I used, <laughs> I used to go down uh, to what is like the Lower East Side. It's like so ritzy now, and you can't. But it's where all the you know that's where all the porn films were made, and some would, would rent uh, a loft. For a weekend, and um, these would be these would be professional people who were doing extra work on the weekend, like carpenters have a job, and then on the weekend they do their own little thing. Uh, and so they were really professional people, and it was really cool to be around them. Just uh, I, it's cool to be around any movie, for instance, it's so professional. So was the porn stuff, you know? um, and I really enjoyed enjoyed my time doing that. But anyway. That's so in the 70s when I was you know, starting to write and, and to publish, that's the job that allowed me to, you know, to uh, do my stuff at night. And, uh, and then eventually the first novel was published and, and uh, it kind of had a, a certain cult um, following, it still does, uh, 40 years on. Um, people know the title and um, and so, uh, but that that novel is, you know, comes out of that new wave science fiction of the era as well. It's a really interesting period, but it also comes back from, from the comic books uh, of the fifties, the fifties and sixties, the Marvel comic books, especially uh, the and stuff. Are you keeping up with comics at that time? Like I guess mid seventies. Oh yeah, 70s? yeah, yeah. No, I, you know, I, I came down here when ninety. Uh, and I was going out to Frank Miller's, you know, every week to get my comics. He had stuck away, so I was buying weekly comics all the way well over into the 2000s. You know, right? The reason I, I ask just, is, um, you know, did you go to Marvel if you're in New York and you're a comics fan and a writer and creative? No, I, I would go to I would go to parties sometimes, you know, um, and there would be these one the guy Chris Claremont. I used to run into him uh, at parties, you know. Uh, like, at different clubs and stuff like that, um, and I'd see these guys. I didn't really know them. But I didn't hang out with them. I hung out with writers, and you know, so it was a kind of different group. But I, I ran into them sometime, and I, I didn't get up. I never went to Marvel, but I, I went to DC um, when I when I wrote for um, uh, Andy Helfer, uh, Paradox. I did, I did some stuff for him, so I, I went up there quite a lot. Uh, I guess that was in the eighties. Was that the green candle or? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that was cool. I really loved going up to DC. It was a fun office. You know, uh, I don't know um, if they brought all the stuff out to California with it, but it was really cool you know, how the office was back there. You also did work for Raw Magazine. I did. Or yeah. I guess Raw Books. It's well, uh, no, I did it for Raw Magazine. Actually, um, what happened was. Uh, um, Gary Panter, uh, you, know, you know Gary, um, who did you know, terrific cartoonist and painter. I've seen Jim Zingo's prank. So uh, anyway, I got a phone call back in the early uh, 80s from Gary, who's, I, I think he was in California at that time. Um, and he, Freaks uh, and More had been out a while, and he asked if he could do a, uh, an adaptation of Freaks and More. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure. You know, um, so I gave him permission to do it. So he did a three-page adaptation of, of Freaks and More and uh, for a Young Lust. Um, uh, and um, so when he moved to when he moved to uh, New York, 
uh, you know, he looked me up, and it was at the time when, um, it's right behind me too, is that, that Art and Francois published Gary's book that has the cardboard box cover. Uh, and uh, so Gary invited me over to the, um, um, to the book signing, which was in a pretty hip club over in New York. Um, and that's when we both met, Santa and I both met Gary uh, that night. And then um, I get a phone call not too long after that from Gary and said, uh, um, uh, Francois and, and Art um, would like to meet you because they, they, uh, by that time, funny papers would come out. Uh, and Art really liked funny papers. And so um, we had them over to our house. We were living in a house in Jersey City. So, uh, and the cool thing about that, the day I met, Francois and Art um, and Gary was there with his first wife and it was the day after Chester Hool died so I know exactly when it was. It was uh, it was 1986, May 1986. Uh, because when we met, uh, the first thing Art said to me is, did you hear Chester Hool died? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first thing we talked about. Um, so. I do. I uh, you know I met them and we hit it off, and, and then I would go over to Green Street, you know, to where Art had his studio and the and his offices, and hang out, and um, and then they you know invited me to contribute to. Well, I was the kind of I was the kind of prose guy. Uh, it raw um, contributed to prose things, and then I, I did some scripting for um, uh, Richard Sadler. Uh, and um, but the fun thing about being involved in law is that um, it was just, I got a chance to meet all these guys, you know, Charles Burns, and, uh, you know. Or, uh, what was that like? Um, were you conscious of things like underground co- comics? Um, I don't know how much alternative comics would have been around. You know, I feel like Raw sort of really blew open the doors. Yeah, well, when I was in grad school, school, which is out in Ohio, um, I mean, it was that era, like I said, I really was kind of, the, right, it was when all the crumb, the zap stuff, and all the, emer- the, the, the underground comics, so all us grad students, you know, you'd have little bags of pot all around and, and underground comics at these get-togethers, you know, uh, and uh, it's also when the, the new uh, law came into um, where they were trying to close down the head shops, so I was there when all the head shops were Writing and do all the underground newspapers and comics and bombs and all that stuff. And then the, the Nixon law came in. Uh, the, the, it said, and the Supreme Court said it's okay that every locality could decide what was, you know, pornographic and stuff. So they closed all these things there. And so we were there when they closed them out, too. So we we'll, said so we were there. Uh, so we um, um, uh, bought a lot of underground. So I knew I knew Art's work and I knew uh, Kim Deitch's work, you know, uh, from those from those books. Uh, and also from the perspective of I was still kind of uh, a historian of the comics. I really I loved learning about you know who did what. And by this time I was much aware of, of, of Richard Alcolt and all those guys at the turn of the century. And, um, so that. Uh, I was I was writing some comics and hanging out with these comics guys, but I was also trying to. I, my grand scheme was um, of when I had published two novels and I changed agents and um, uh, my agent said, "Well, what do you want to do now?" And I said, "In those days, when there was a career to be had in in, in uh, uh, publishing fiction in America." You know, it's like the third book would have to be your big one, you know? Like, they would carry you, you know, the, the third one you had to really get with or your career was kind of in danger. So I wanted to do something really cool, so I put this, I proposed this novel called Funny Papers, which was supposed to be the history of comic strips beginning in the 1890s, all the way up, <laughs> all the way up to like 1980. It was supposed to be one big book. And there were a lot of those kind of novels at the time these sweeping sagas of families coming from Europe and, you know, it would end up with them being millionaires or something like this. So I had the idea of doing, instead of a family, I would do it about a comic strip and all the different people who wrote and drew it over, you know, 100 years. So I sold it uh, uh, on a basis of, you know, uh, I knew what I was doing. I'd done some homework. And and then uh, I spent uh, at least two years 
going over whenever I could from Jersey City to Manhattan, and you know, then over to Ninth Avenue, which is where they had the uh, newspaper addicts. And in those days, they still had uh, they still had microfilm, but they also had papers too. So uh, I'd be cranking through all these old papers, and then I could actually see the, the old Sunday supplements and newspapers and things. That's long gone, but uh, that's how I did my research, and then, and then I realized that. Um, I had written about 400 pages of the novel in about two years. <laughs> <laughs> like from 1896 to 1996. <laughs> no, this ain't going to work. Uh, so I said, could we do like just a novel about the 90s and the beginnings of the comic strip? And so that's, I said, yeah, okay. So we did uh, funny papers. And then I still had this grand scheme, but it took a a long time to get from 1984 when Funny Paper was 85, and I didn't do the second one until uh, 96. Uh, Is that the first time when you were doing research and saw like the big Sunday pages? Is that the first time you encountered this? I might have seen some uh, original art by then, you know, uh, because uh, if you went over to those uh, those conventions uh, in New York in the hotels in those days. Um, in the early 70s and throughout the 70s and even uh, there were some auctions and you'd actually see the original art uh, I could see that. I remember I went to, there was a place up in uh, Rye New York in a castle that North Walker started this comic museum that we used to go up there about once a month because they'd have cartoonists from the New Yorker coming on Sundays and give little talks and stuff and it wasn't that long a drive maybe an hour drive uh, and uh, that's when I saw the real big stuff. And uh, I still remember this. Like, oh, God. There was a Prince Valiant. You know, Rick, they were selling it to raise money. And it was like, I guess, 19, I don't know, 85, 87. It was like $700. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. I looked and I said, yeah, but don't, you know, $700 in 1987 was probably, you know, $7,000 now. But still, man, I look at that and I could have had that stuff. So. <laughs> did, did you know uh, Bill Blackbeard or any Never of these met kind of characters? I knew who he was, certainly. You know, certainly everybody knew who he was and the clipping all that stuff and its preservation. When I was doing the research for Funny Papers, he was a, a godsend. And the, there was a guy. Um, how, uh, how was he a godsend? Can you just explain? Because that stuff was being saved that, like, um, you, I mean, if. Give me an example. Uh, I I lived in Jersey City at one point. I was on the um, uh, they asked me to be on the library board in Jersey City, you know. Uh, and I would go to these meetings, and you know they had two writers on the library board, and we we're trying to you know um, take care of the library. And I went up in the attic of the library once where no one was supposed to go, and I found all this old stuff up there, including an entire box that had not been opened since 1898, and it had on it. Um, uh, Cuban War. I opened it up because that's what my novel was said. And inside were all the color supplements for the yellow kid uh, from that summer. Wow. Um, that they had saved separately because it was like a, the yellow kid went to Cuba for a period during the war. I thought, oh my God. So uh, uh, I, I, I just looked at the stuff and I you know used what I could for the novel and stuff. I went back and it was all gone. They'd thrown around one. They'd no. thrown all their paper out. You know, they'd thrown all the magazines because well, we would put it on my food. But they hadn't done that at all. You know, so so Bill Black you know, to get back to him was one of those guys who said, No, let's let's save this stuff, you know. And he must have had a crazed I mean, how he stored it, I have no idea. But everybody knew who he was, uh, and he would be he would publish some of this stuff you know with int introductions you know um so everybody knew that this was the guy who was preserving this stuff everybody who cared about that stuff uh and he was really important to us um in, in you know that burgeoning comics history field now this comics history is such a you know established thing but basically back in the 80s it, you know it was kind of an amateur amateur thing uh, but people were trying more and more to get the real story and to see the real stuff because so much was fantasy you know the stories of how this happened and who how they did it and they were basically apocryphal stories you know uh, 
and then you'd see a little slip, you know, one one example of a comic strip, but you had no idea the context of it or anything. So Bill Blackbeard was really, really important. And there was a guy named Rick Marshall who I did know. I did know Rick very well, uh, Richard Marshall, who's still around and still doing historical stuff. Um, Bill Blackbeard was out on you know, the West Coast primarily. Rick was in Pennsylvania and, and Rick um, actually helped me meet the first strip cartoonist I ever met because I wrote to him, he had done some editing of comic stuff, and I, I wrote to him when I started doing funny papers and, uh, to ask him some specific questions, and, and Rick lived up in Greenwich, 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 or, or one of those players where all the cartoonists lived in those days, um, and he uh, invited me up. Uh, so I went up with him, uh, we drove up, and you know, the cartoonists had, they all lived within spitting distance of each other. Um, what's his name? Son, uh, did that book last year. Uh, John Colin Murphy's son, uh, did it. You should read it, it's a great book. I just uh, picked it up, I haven't had a chance just, to read it. So I went up there and met all these guys and I had cocktail parties. It was just, it was just like dropping into the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> they, they, you know, they lived very well. They had Sunday afternoon cocktail parties. They, all the cartoons came in, in, you know, they came in sport coats, uh, and their wives came in dresses. And it was just like, oh my god! And every time you turn around, oh, there's a guy with Prince Valley, and there's a guy with, you know, uh, uh, Hagar. I, mean, she, I met everybody that, you know, and Rick was very helpful. And and uh, in there's a in the second Derby Dugan book. Dugan, um, Derby Dugan's, uh, nice the third one, Dugan Underground. There's a, a, a kind of fictionalized version of the cocktail party I, I went to in, in, in Westport, uh, Connecticut. Um, so Rick was one of those guys um, who would put out these books back in the 70s and 80s, along with Bill Blackwood. Beard. Um, and so that's kind of where like, fandom becomes um, kind of almost serious scholarship, you know, that kind of the, the, those two guys were important to me. That's fascinating. So you're looking at, obviously, the source material and you can get your hands on old, old prints. You're talking to and interviewing cartoonists. Yeah. Was there any other research that went into funny papers? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I had to research the period, which, you know, I just got lost in. And it, sort of, it changed my life, you know, as a writer. I, I, read, I wrote a, a fantasy novel and then I wrote a crime novel uh, and then I got involved in doing this novel about the beginning of comic strips and, uh, I, and I really basically turned into a historical novelist not always but a, a lot of my books and it was it was the accidental you know I it was done accidentally I didn't mean to do that um, and I'm not a trained researcher so to learn about the 1890s I, I had to read all these books and biographies and um, one of the things that helped me is that in those days, um, uh, editors, newspaper editors, syndicate editors, all those people actually used to write their memoirs and get them published. So if you went, like I would go to the Jersey City Library, which was a great old library, and there'd be like all these Hearst editors, you know, uh, who wrote about being an editor in the 1910s and all that. And so all these people that you were writing about, they, they knew and they had all these great little stories. So a lot of the stuff that went into point papers or later the the other books in the you know, I got from a lot of these memoirs of editors of syndicates and newspapers and stuff like that. So, but it was it, it was um, you know I like doing that. It, uh, someone said to me, um, you know, does similar stuff. It's like the closest thing you ever get to be a time traveler. It's true when you do this kind of intense research. I used to go over to Ninth Avenue uh, to the newspaper annex in New York. And you'd be there all day long cranking and you're reading all these stories about 1896 and this woman poisons her husband and you're reading about what the president is doing and, and it's like, you know, Grover Cleveland or something like that. Uh, and then like, you're, re you're seeing all these you know, drawings because they weren't photographs yet of, you know, of vehicles in the street and all this kind of stuff. And then you'd like look up and you'd be kind of shocked. <laughs> that you have electric light and there's, there's cars, you know, out there. So you kind of get lost in this world and it's kind of fun. Um, yeah. But it can, it leads to certain things like taking real long to do a novel, whereas like if you write about 
you know, 2019, you know, I have to worry about explaining what this is or what people eat or how people dress and all that kind of stuff. So it was a, you know, I'm glad I did it, but it, I mean, even a Superman book, you know, took a lot of research um, to do the, the early 1930s, you know. So, but it's, if you like to do it, it's fun. Uh, I wish I had been trained. I was not trained. I was, you know, I was a sociology major and then I got a, um, you know, graduate degree in creative writing. So as far as how to be a researcher, you know, I just learned it myself. When you were doing this initial research, or maybe I should frame it this way, I'm looking at the Smithsonian collection of newspaper comics. Uh, did that come out before, during, or after you really got in deep with putting that novel together? Oh gosh, it's a good question. I think it. I think it uh, came out during, uh, during or right after. It's a, yeah, that book is great. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, that book is 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 in everybody every cartoonist that I know. Gold standard. That book, you know, has it in their studio, um, and it's not available anymore. Is it? It's just out of print. Well, the good news they made a lot of them, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're I, around. You can't find them at yeah, affordable yeah, price. That's true. that's true. They made a lot of them in those days. Yeah, great stuff. First time I saw certain strips that I'd never seen before. You know, uh, but. Were there, yeah, there's no way to see that before the end. I mean, I, I see all this stuff on, uh, on Facebook now. I have all these Facebook groups, so I'm seeing all this stuff, you know. But there's no very few ways to see a lot of that stuff. When you were taking a look at, at um, the early strips during the research, is there still, I mean, we're sitting in a room with a ma an amazing uh, archive of comic strips. Is there any strips that haven't yet received the reprint treatment uh, for the modern day that, that, uh, that you see as being kind of like... Uh, a missed opportunity or something? You know, it's funny, uh, my friend Harry Matetsky who I've mentioned to you, you know, the comics, uh, original art collector, um, we have these monthly conversations about comics, you know, what's up, what's coming out, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, we keep on talking about it, the golden age is basically passing, the golden age of, of reprint books is kind of coming to an end. Um, and, you know, time, uh, Tiny Tim, Prince is a great one that, that will probably never be um, uh, collected. There are, there are some, but I, like, I was shocked that I'm delighted that Little Joe, you know, Harold Gray's other, you know, strip that was attributed to his cousin is coming out, <laughs> like this beautiful large edition. So, uh, there, there are things, you know, that, that I wish had been done, but I think everything's been covered. You know, it's, I can't think of anything that... As in, I mean, Al Youp, no one ever did the complete Al Youp, but I don't know if we need it. There's been some really great books that kind of get the best years. I think one of the things that with reprints that have been a problem is that they, is this completest uh, gene that comics people seem to have. Well, I, I have it. Yeah, sure. you know, like, like, oh, I got to have it from the first. But the strips were always great from the right. first, you know? I think if, if, for instance, the Dick Tracy strips might have, the Dick Tracy books might have sold more if they started like in the 40s, and then you can fill in later on the earlier ones, you know? Uh, but it's like, let's start at the beginning and doggedly go through. Uh, but I think now, this there's a little Library of American Comics that does the year of a, of a strip. Nice idea, you know? Just pick one of the, one of the years of the strip and, and it gives you, because you can't get an idea of a strip from like a week or so, you know? If you want to know what a strip was like and what the rhythms were like, um, view of the world if you really need to see a year. But a lot of these stories, you don't really need more than that. You know? The great ones, yes, I'm glad that Dick Tracy is three volumes away from being finished. You know, I never thought in my lifetime, I mean, that's like, that's an amazing feat, right? It's like the complete words of Victor Hugo, the complete words of Chester Gould. That's pretty amazing. So, but I, I, I was talking to Art Spiegelman not too long ago about this. I was, I was saying, what do you think the print runs on these things. Oh, God. I said, you think it's like 5,000? He said, is it that much? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it's amazing that these people, you know, these publishers and the editors and, you know, are, are behind it. But it's a great public service. I mean, um, yeah. Orphan Annie, I mean, just Orphan Annie is a, with a strip with the behind Dick Tracy. 
on the Daily News on Sundays. Um, and I would cut Dick Tracy out, but I, the Dick Tracy had the Daily News logo on the top, so I'd cut it off to put it on my wall. But we cut off the top of the orphan Annie behind it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't read a lot of I didn't read a lot of orphan Annie when I was a kid. It scared me, you know. It was very dark and, and stern looking, and it seemed like very Victorian, and everybody's dress seemed like from another era. So I didn't get Orphan Annie, I didn't saw a little bit of it, until this series. I, this is a revelation, this is the greatest comic strip you know, that has ever been done in terms of writing, uh, the most sus- the sustained piece of work. But I couldn't, I didn't know it as a 12 year old or 14 year old. So this is a great, you know, there's still a few years to go for Orphan Annie, but it's an amazing thing that has happened that these books are, are available. Like Rip Kirby, my, my mom, is, you know, Rip Kirby was uh, Al Train's last creation. He died less than 10 years into doing it. Um, I said, it's amazing that, that they've done like, you know, 20 years of Rip Kirby, uh, which is a detective strip, you know, taken over by John Fremis. Uh, he's one of the guys I met uh, at the cocktail party. Um, he's long dead now, so I can tell you the story. That <laughs> <laughs> I, I was talking to John, and I was like, "Oh my God, you know, this is um, such an honor to meet you." Um, you, you know, Rip Kirby's my mom's favorite comic strip, and he'll she'll be so thrilled to anyone. <laughs> right, <laughs> he just went right back, fell right down, he was standing, and then he just fell over, and he drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, is he dead? Apparently that happened quite a lot. <laughs> a lot of that alcoholism in the oh comics. Oh my God, yeah. If you read Duke and Underground, the first part of the novel is about the, the, uh, the alcoholics of Westport, <laughs> the cartoonists. Yeah. But, uh, but I think they had fun. Oh my God. You got to read that book. Yeah, it's, it's just a joy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that I one. Forget the so. name of it. Yeah, I do too. Country. Cartoon, right. Yeah, cartoon Country. Um, let's talk about the reception of Funny Pages. Okay. So this book comes out. I'm not sure what the state of comics are like exactly around that time period. How was the novel received? It was it, like, like I said, I made this, this you know decision. I was going to have to do a big novel if I wanted to, you know, continue my career. And this was going to be a fat novel. It was you know, it was my longest novel, uh, and it was really well received. I mean, it was the first time I've been reviewed in the New York Times book review. Got a half page review. Um, it got lots and lots of reviews. It was a front page review of the San Francisco Chronicle book review. I was astounded. And, but you know, in that era, it was 50, 80, 84, 85. Um, it was, you know, Marvel Comics had come along and become what they what it was, and people knew Spider Man and all that kind of stuff. The comic strips were kind of dying in the newspapers. So I uh, um, saw someone writing a novel about the comic strips. Was kind of nostalgic and people, you know. so um, it was funny. The comics just went way down. So I was writing a novel about comics. It's a story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very well received, um, and it was very well reviewed. When it wasn't reviewed by some idiot who would like, pow, biff, damn, right. you know, like I don't know how many of those reviews start out like I'm saying. What are you doing? You know, it's a little of that kind of goofiness that was still when you wrote about comic books or comic strips, the, the writer would have to distance him or herself from it by saying how silly this was. You know, uh, it was not a major art form. So, but there were a few in between, but it was annoying enough. But I mean, it was reviewed in uh, Comics Journal, which was a great thrill to me. It was reviewed by. Uh, uh, Bob Harvey, who even drew one of the first pictures of Pinfold uh, that, were, you know, uh, that were done, that was done. So yeah, it was it was really well received. And then the second one, uh, Derby Dugan's Depression Funnies, didn't come out for like, ten years from the first. I had done other books in the meantime, and uh, I had and it would never have come out if it wasn't for Art Spiegelman, you know, because Artie and I were. We were friends by then, and we had worked together at Raw, but we were still friends. And you know, he'd come over to my house, and I'd go over to his house, and um, I knew his kids, and you know, he knew mine, you know. So we were friends, but uh, we had become friends because he was a fan of Funny Pages. Um, and so he'd always say, When are you gonna 
finishing. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you know, it was well received, but it didn't make a lot of money. It didn't, it didn't win any awards. I've gone on to other things. He said, no, you should finish it. You should finish it. And um, I think because <laughs> he knew that the second part was about the 30s, which <laughs> uh, it was more interesting to him. You know? uh, so I had started. I had written about 50 or 60 pages of it at one point. And, and uh, I showed it to an agent who had been, you know, who was no longer my agent, and said, nah, you know, the first one didn't do well. Maybe you should go on something else. So, um, Art, um, we were on the phone one night, just you know, chatting with my friends do, and he brought it up again. And uh, I said, oh, Art, you know, I said, it'd be fun to do it, but, you know, does the world need another book on cartoonists, you know, particularly from the 1930s, you know? Um, he said, no, it'd be good, it'd be good. Uh, so I said, oh, I don't think so. So we hung up, and then, you know, two minutes later, it was that. Phone rings again. It was him. And he said, Look, if you do the novel, I'll do the cover. <laughs> uh, he had, he had one, you know, mouse had come out. And so, you know, they, uh, all right. Uh, and also, he was someone who, who um, went to a publisher that he knew, uh, an editor that he knew, and said, You, you got to look at this guy's. And it was only like 50 or 60 pages. So that's why the book is dedicated to him. Not only did he do the cover, but he did the frontispiece, piece, and uh, it's just a beautiful piece of work that um, that he did. And so I was always grateful. Um, but the book would have not been, I would have done it if it hadn't been for him saying he wanted, he wanted to see that book. So. Yeah, I guess we owe him a, a thank you. Yeah, yeah. And and I all uh, uh, once Paul Auster came up with the title because it was called Walter's Ghost. And they kept on saying to publishing the company, that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, we've got you know, Walter's ghost, the cartoonist ghost, uh, who drew the strip uh, for somebody else. Um, and so you gotta get another, gotta get another uh, title on that. Uh, Art was over <laughs> at Paul Wasser's house in Brooklyn and was telling him, and Paul Wasser said, well, what's the book about? And Paul told him what it was about, and he came up with the title. And, and then Art called me, I said, not sure about that. Uh, that's an awful long title. <laughs> so, but then the, you know the editors liked it, and the publisher liked it, and so I'd come to like it. <laughs> that's that's uh, whenever I think about that '30s era cartoonist culture, I think of your book. Like I'll read you know interviews with Milk and Niff or you know various cartoonists, but it's like you tend to capture sort of the social side of that. The, the I guess rock star, you know the idea. Yeah, that yeah. These cartoonists, like they were the top of the mountain. They were. They went golfing with presidents, and you know they were they were cool. They were the life uh, of the party. And yeah. They, One thing I would have always I, I put a little scene in there where I just it was fascinating that all these guys had apartments uh, in Tudor City, which was this really cool uh, apartment complex right around the corner from the New York Daily News building, and they, that's where they drew their comic strips. You know, they were all and they. You're in this bedroom. You're in. You're. You know. You're in the living room. Uh, just how cool would make it look out the window. You're in Forty Second Street in New York. I thought, yeah, that's cool. Uh, Is that still there? Do you know? Tudor City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's um, it's very, very expensive. I think I don't think it's rentals anymore. It's probably condos. Hmm. Probably one condo back in the nineties. But I went over there for sure. And you know, all the things that I could still find in New York. You know, the Puck Building. I, I went to the Puck Building long before it was, you know, refurbished. Uh, when it was just, I think it was an ink factory. Hmm. Uh, and all the, 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 the little end things where it had Puck, the end pieces that were all kind of gold, and all, you couldn't even see them. They were so dirty. You know, they hadn't been cleaned in 70 years. Um, it's amazing that the Puck Building, you know, survived. But I used to go all over New York, you know, okay, this is. This is where Kinef had a studio. This is where this, and, and trying to find, you know, to be there, and just trying to suck it up. So, um, yeah, that was like a. So, Doom Underground came out in 2001. So, it was a 20, um, 21 year project to do those books. Um, um, but worth, worth finishing. Um, yeah, it's probably the fastest I've ever read 
three books. <laughs> <laughs> I think once I started reading them, I read all three in like ten days, and it was just like oh, revelations. Thanks. thanks. Yeah, the one thing that about those, those books that uh, maybe didn't help them, maybe did. I don't know, but each of them was supposed to be in the style that was predominant at the time. Like, you know, the tough guy in the '30s style, and the more kind of like uh, uh, you know. Victorian era prose of, of funny papers, and then the, the real disjointed uh, uh, kind of sixties uh, uh, countercultural uh, stuff of the last book. Um, so they don't sound alike, even though they have the, kind of the linkages. Um, it's, it's, a, it's very interesting to hear you say that. It makes perfect sense now that I hear you describe that, and especially that second one has that even that adventure sense. Like yeah, the yeah, adventure yeah. strips. Yeah, uh, very dynamic the way that moves. Yeah, I couldn't get the voice for Depression Funnies for a long time. I really, and, I, and uh, finally read, uh, you ever read uh, Rex Stout's Neural Wolf novels? Uh, I said, that's it. <laughs> that's the sound. That's the sound. Uh, Archie Goodwin, the narrator. The, uh, um, if you read any of those Archie Goodwin novels and you read um, Depression Funnies, you'll say, oh, yeah, that kind of sound you want to just deliver. So your fourth uh, comics novel would be a Superman, yeah. um, set I guess in the 30s. Yeah, it starts in the 20s, really. I mean, it's referring back to the 20s. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting story. That that's kind of like I'm. I look back now and say this was either the best thing I ever did or I, I shouldn't have ever done that um, <laughs> uh, because they they started courting me. In, in, um, uh, 97, I got a phone call and a letter from uh, um, Steve Corte, who was special projects editor at DC, and, and he said that he and, oh God, what's the guy's name? It was Paul Levitz, who were having lunch, and they said, you know, it's funny, we've had all, all these versions of Superman and movies, and, but no one has ever done anything currently for just put Superman back in the era that he was from, except when they moved back to Siegel and Tristan. Um, and both of them, and both of them, but I know Paul for sure, had read um, Depression Funnies and, and uh, said, you know, you know it would be good to do that, Tom B. Haven, uh, and those comics, and they did this book. Uh, so that's how they contacted me. And it was, uh, I was still working on um, some projects. I was down here, I was teaching full time. Uh, I was doing some script work and I was working for Entertainment Weekly doing like about three reviews a month. And uh, I said, you know, this is really a cool idea. I really can't do anything now. It's in the finishing, um, do nothing about So they said, well, uh, whenever you're ready. <laughs> it's like, and they kept on sending me um, those um, those wonderful hardcover Superman mm -hmm. action. Yeah, we did those, that series there. Right. And they would send it. like, and I said, well, anyway, whenever you're ready, and I'd look, and they were courting me, you know, which was like, wow, this has never happened before. They'd send me these $50 books, and they're really cool, you know. And I, I, so anyway, I, uh, 2001, it's like four years later, we're still in touch, and I said, well, if you're still, still interested, uh, I don't have anything on the play button. They said, yeah, yeah, work up, a, work up a proposal. So I did. I worked up a really cool proposal, uh, I thought, and then... <laughs> But it was rejected because it was it had Siegel and Schuster in it. As mm. uh, and that was the time when all this bad blood was going on, all the lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. They said, "Oh no, 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 no." So I, I said, "They said, could you could you do another one?" Um, so I did a uh, I did another outline, um, and uh, and um, I guess it was about twelve page outline or something like that. And uh, they uh, they accepted it. So, uh, and I started on this thing that ended up taking me four years to do. Um, but I got really involved in 1930s life, and uh, I got really interested in trying to put real people in. And so, like, if Alfred Hitchcock makes an appearance, he really was in New York that week. You know, I did all these kinds of things, and I looked it up and. It, like dead on, you know. If, if if so and so was there, he was really there. And then then it dawned to me, this is the coolest thing that ever happened in my pictures. Dawned to me that I wanted this to end in 1938 
around the time that Action Comic 1 came out. So that really would have been like April, April or May of 38. But I'm looking at what's going on in April, May of 38, I'm saying, Our Town premieres. It's my favorite play. <laughs> I love Our Town. So I knew then I was going to have this end with him being at the premiere of Our Town, which is this kind of bucolic, you know, small bill kind of, you know, uh, it's, that's, that's the way it's going to end. So it's kind of just by trying to get everything right uh, in that book in terms of um, what was going on in the real world uh, so that Superman wouldn't seem so absurd. If I <laughs> real stuff in, um, led to the perfect ending um, of, of the book for me. Because I, I generally don't <clears throat> like a lot of the endings of my stories. Uh, I think I could have done better, but that's, I couldn't do better than that. So, um, <clears throat> I loved how that um, book came out. It's like it's my second favorite book of all the stuff I've done. It's, uh, Depression Funny is my first, and, and Superman is my second. Really proud of it. <clears throat> and then, um, how do I say it? It's either the stupidest thing or the best thing I ever did. Because of that, <clears throat> I um, um, there's another story of Art Stevens. <laughs> he's, he's like my guardian angel, uh, but. Somebody came to Yale University Press was doing a, a series called American Icons. These little beautiful little fifty thousand word books about Fred Astaire, the hamburger, you no know, like these American things, the electric chair. And uh, <clears throat> they came to art and asked him if he would do if he would do a book on Albert E. Newman. I said, Yeah, oh, my dead body. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, but he said, you know what you should do? You should you should get Tom DeHaven into a book about Superman. He just wrote this novel about Superman. Superman's an American icon. So I got a call from uh, uh, Yale University Press. Like, this is pretty cool, right? I, I've been in the university, but I'm not an academic, you know. But here I am. I got my I got my credentials now. Um, and uh, they asked me if I'd do this. They bring me into New York. I had I had lunch at the Yale Club. Do you ever know who the Yale Club is? I mean, you know, it's across the street from Grand Central Station. You can only go in there if you went to Yale. And they have, it's like an enormous building. And if you're in New York and you graduate from Yale, you can use their bedrooms. You know, they got a hotel. Room. Nice. So, that's pretty cool. So they bring me up there and, and I do this. And again, it's another four and a half years. <laughs> it's it's 50,000 words, but I just, they wanted like why Superman matters. So I had to read the comic strips, read the comic books, the radio shows, and I listen to them, and, you know, the cartoons, the Fleischer cartoons, and all, like, all the stuff, and then the whole business about Stephen and Schuster and their story, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, I had more notebooks and stuff on this uh, than I could ever have imagined. And I, it's four drafts, you know, four drafts for that book, which I never did, I was, you know. Uh, but I'm really happy with that too. So, like, like, ten years of my life is involved with Superman, which I never would have. Like, how did that? How did that happen? <laughs> but uh, it, you know, I really am very proud of those two works. Really, really proud of those two works. But now they have a book. I could have done a lot of the stuff, you know. Uh, and then, of course, I don't own the rights. And then by that, you know, the. the, the um, they wouldn't give me rights. DC would not give me the right to any images <laughs> to use in the Yale book. I had just done this book for them, right? And they would not, so I had to buy, I had to buy on my own pocket, I had to buy some pictures for like the Superman TV show. That's why there's no pictures of like Wayne Boring. I talk about all this stuff in the book. There's no illustration. This DC wouldn't give me permission. I said, are you kidding me? They, they yeah. have some really strange okay. policies. Like people will get into the best comics of the year book with you know something they did with DC, and they won't give them rights. For I know it's, 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 they always tell me, and it's true. Of all the people I met at DC, you know, Andy Helfer and all those people, the editors, I really like them. Really like them. They always say it's the lawyers. Yeah, the lawyers, and uh, it's it's true. But I mean, I, I'm so big, like, what do you mean you won't give me permission to use a couple of panels, this kind of stuff. So. That's why there's no images from DC in, in uh, our hero book. I think Sean Howe did it the best where he came out with that Marvel book and then he had a blog 
separately where he'd run all the images. <laughs> and then if they slap if they slap his hand, he'd take the image down. Yeah. No, you know, no harm, no foul. Yeah. No, it's just, it was, well, you know, the, uh, one little story, and I don't want to go after DC, it's like, we're an inspiration, I'm glad I did what I did, and uh, Paul Levis is a nice guy, and all this, but um, the summer before it Superman was supposed to come out, five years I worked on this book, you know, between prepping it and doing the research and writing it. I'm really excited about it. Everybody seemed really excited about it. Um, and then I'm on, a, on this island off the coast of Maine in a writer's colony. And this was 2005, something like that. And the only thing we had, the only phone service then was a satellite phone. And together, you had to go up there on a hillside, <laughs> on top of the hill. And it's the only place we could get phones. And so uh, people would go up to make a phone call or if a phone would ring, you know, it would, I don't know how we'd hear it. But anyway, I got, I got called one afternoon. Um, was a phone call for me on the island. I was like, well, who called me? So I went up on it, and it was a lawyer for DC Comics. <laughs> the novel was coming out in a few weeks. They were not happy because it just so happened that that Superman, I think Man of Steel, or one, one of the ones, no, one before Man of Steel, was coming out. And so they, they were a little annoyed that my book was coming out around the same time as the Superman movie, which they had more interest in. But the guy just read me this thing. Like, all right, uh, we don't want you to talk about Superman three months before and three months after <laughs> this movie comes out. So, of course, uh, we want we want you to know that you do not you did not create Superman. Jerome Siegel, Jerry Siegel, <laughs> is a co owned by DC. I said, what are you telling me? Are you, are you kidding me? You brought me up here, you know, on an island, and you're, you're reading me the riot about who you feel Superman. So I got so angry, I, I hung up on them. Uh, and I don't know who that person was. And, but I had to feel like, it's like they really wish they hadn't done that novel because it just kind of, it took me so long. They didn't think the book was going to take so long that and it just kind of came out at the same time. As, and they thought, oh, people were going to be confused. Like, well, they didn't be confused. <laughs> they could only help one or the other, right? You know? um, but anyway, that's DC. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, for many years, I was just like, very bitter. But, with that book, to bring her back to alternative independent comics, how did Chris Ware do the cover? Who arranged for that to happen? Oh, well, um, Chris, um, again, uh, I met through I met through Art. I, uh, I met when Art... Because Art was publishing him, right? Yeah, Art was publishing him, you know, when he was at the University of Texas, right? He was sending this stuff. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so I never met, because Chris lived in Chicago. and But anyway... Uh, um, Francoise and Art had gotten married by the Justice of Peace, you know, back in the 70s. And they decided, I don't know when it was, uh, but they decided that they were going to um, uh, have a really big way, you know, uh, with all their friends. And so they did. And so Santa and I went up to New York. Uh, it was a really cool place. And everybody was there from to the music, which is a great time. Well, so I'm sitting at this table, and right next to me, is this really tall guy, uh, and it's, it's Chris Ware and his wife, you know. So we spent the whole night at the wedding sitting on the So we became kind of chummy, uh, and we could stay in touch. And he told, he said that uh, if Funny Papers ever came back out again, he would really like to do the cover because he didn't like the cover. No one liked the cover. Art even hated the cover from the first book. Uh, and uh, I said, okay, I'll keep that in mind. And uh, so there was no interest in bringing the first funny papers out again. But when Superman was coming out, um, and they were saying to me, uh, Chronicle Books, who do you think we should get for the cover? Uh, I said, well, um, how about Chris Ware? And I think um, the first book had come out, right? Um, Corrigan? Yeah. Corrigan, yeah. Acme Novelty. Or, yeah. Uh, or Corgan, yeah. Certainly Acme Novelty. Yeah, yeah. But, but the Corgan was out. Yeah. And they said, oh, God, I don't know if we can get him. Um, I said, well, you know, we can't. We can't. Uh, and he just did. He just did. Yeah, really. um, and uh, no one knew what he was going to do. No one no one talked to him. It's a beautiful cover. It's a beautiful yeah. cover. But the thing that no one noticed at first when he did the spine, where the Chronicle books would fall over the, you know, over the eyes of, of the Superman image on the, on the spine, it's just perfect. 
it was Clark. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a beautiful cover. And everyone would say, oh, I don't get it. I don't get it. And then they'd see the little thing up at the top. You know? uh, it was a beautiful cover. Um, so I was really grateful to him. And uh, um, we were supposed to meet. I was on a book tour for that. He was on a book tour. We were both in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, he was at some bookstore, and I was at another bookstore. And we were going to meet, and he was going to sign one, and blah, blah, blah. We never got together. I've never seen him since. Um, but uh, stay in touch every once in a while. But that was a lucky, a lucky thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I owe a lot to Raw <laughs> and the art of Prince Lost. I want to hear more about this wedding. That was a great wedding. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, I think Tom, that's a pretty good spot to wrap up. Okay. Um, did well, we miss anything comics wise? You wanted to? Oh, well, I forgot you reviewed Entertainment Weekly. Yeah, Wasn't that pretty much when they started? Yeah, I started. I was the first book reviewer for Entertainment Weekly '90, and I used, I did reviews for comics, and I was telling Chris I think not too long ago. I, they asked me to review comics for Enchain Weekly, so I did. And then I got to write for the comics for the New Yorker, the New York Times, rather, before Douglas Wolf grabbed that gig. <laughs> uh, but the thing was that all through the 90s, because I had done comic reviews for Enchain Weekly, I was just inundated. Uh, like every book was sent to me, you know. They didn't say, oh, that's great. But after a while, I was like, I don't want to do all this mm -hmm. stuff. You know, <clears throat> thank God that kind of. You know, finally after all these years, you know, I'd stop it. Even years after I stopped reviewing for them, I would get uh, stuff. NDM, you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, they drew a lot of European albums and stuff. They were amazing. It's just that you have to How long were you with them? Because I'm curious if you had anything to do with uh, Entertainment Weekly bringing Harvey Picar over to do a uh, small tenure of uh, strips over there. You know, I don't. I, I did it from ninety to two thousand. I know it was, I was two. It was ten years, but I didn't have anything to do with that. The only thing I, that I did have something to do with, I'm kind of proud of, is that I, uh, because I was a judge for the Eisners um, and got to know Jackie Estrada and, and the people out at, at San Diego. And so Jackie was saying once that they really needed some place to do the uh, to house all the all the Eisner books and all that kind of stuff and the trophies and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, my my college uh, where I teach VCU has a, a special collections, it's comics and I'm sure they would love so I put I put them together and kind of brokered that deal. So um, that's the repository um, to this day. That's amazing. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah every so I mean how many submissions they get right. a year? Submissions, every everything. You know, there's uh, <laughs> it's like uh, I guess uh, trophies that never got picked up you know all that kind of stuff everything is there uh, if you want to know any about the Eisners see all this stuff who was nominated all that kind of stuff it's there. So. that's extraordinary um, could you talk a little bit more about their comics and special holdings because you know like we're seeing more of this spring up and people know about the Billy Ireland and, and yeah. know about some of these institutions but VCU is one I know about from Chris you know yeah. from Chris Pitzer um, maybe tell her audience. yeah well um Again, I'm, I'm kind of proud that uh, you know, I started teaching when I came down here. I had been teaching comics at Rutgers since 1987. Uh, Funny Papers came out, a uh, professor of the American Studies uh, Department at Rutgers, who runs it, who's a friend of mine, um, said, Would you come and teach a, a comics class um, for us? And I did. And uh, it was like hugely successful, like you know, 120, 130 people in this class. First time comics have been taught at Rutgers. And so I started teaching over there. I've been teaching at Hopkins. So I I taught comics every year, uh, as well as other stuff while I was at Rutgers. But when I come down here, I said to them, you know, I, I don't want to just teach creative writing, I do this other thing. And uh, I kind of expected to get some pushback, but I didn't. Um, no, you know, they said, yeah, okay, I guess they didn't care, I don't know. Uh, but I would teach, I would teach classes, and I always taught. Uh, you know, history of the American comic strip, you know, graphic novels, it's an undergraduate and graf uh, graduate classes in comics, you know, all 28 years I was here. So in the early days, um, uh, these classes, uh, one of the women uh, who was in the class, uh, um, Cindy, uh, was working over at the library as well when she was in my class. 
Uh, and she was aware that you know they had this comic collection up there that um, Tom Inch had given all of his stuff, but no one had really paid attention to it or, or put it together or anything. So um, Cindy um, said, you know, comics sound really interesting, you know. Uh, she was interested in it uh, even before she took my class, but I guess after my class. You know. um, so she basically kind of said, Let's, can we do this? They let her do it. They started lettering her putting it in. And, and then people, you know, started giving more and more. And then they started actually seeking people to, to turn over their collections and things. And Cindy's been there. How long do you think she's been there for? I mean, mid 90s. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, I'm going on. 20 years, maybe 24 years, she's put this thing together. So, and then, you know, there's the, not only the comic strips, but there's some original art, and then there's artifacts like the Billy the back door. And, How did he end up with that? Do you know? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, and then they got, a, you know, they've got some really big pocket, deep pocket collectors who are turning over their stuff to them or saying, what do you need? So, you know, it's, you know, Billy Ireland is just like, that's the, you know, gold standard. Everybody knows about that. He's one of the University of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Michigan. Michigan, Michigan yeah. State, uh, Michigan State. Uh, but, but on the East Coast, you know, VCU, um, it's pretty good. You know, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, particularly for the comic books, you know, undergrounds, I think zines. Um, and it's very nicely organized. And, uh, so anyway, uh, comics, you know, I was teaching it and then, uh, now comics at VCU is pretty much established. I mean, you know, Kelly Holder's teaching comic book making and drawing. Uh, I was teaching as literature and pop culture in the English department. So um, it's pretty much, um, you know, we have classes and then there's been all the history classes that have used Mouse and Persepolis and all these things, uh, women's studies over the years. So all these classes have been feeding into that special collection and so they're using it. So this, this the students, undergraduate and graduate, are, are using this collection. So um, it's um, it's you know this year, uh, Chris was must have told you about it. You know, last week or did you go with the the, the rice? You know, so then finally there's a you know a, a, a com, com, you know, convention here in Richmond connected to the special collection. So yeah, it's it's a um, it's a it's a good collection. You know, uh, I gave. Um, Lot of stuff. Um, this is nothing. I mean, I, we had a big house and we moved into the city. And I had to at least 50, 70 percent of my books away, or because we had no room for them. So a lot of my comics over the years, we, we print books as part of their collection. Um, so it's a, it's a good one. If you've never been there, you always check it out. The city's terrific, you know. Um, they don't have a lot of original art of, of a first class, you know, like Billy Ireland stuff that you just knock your socks off. Um, they have some original art, but I think they have a really good comic book collection. Um, pretty much anything you can think of. Our friend uh, Brian, who does the bubble zine, goes in there a lot for research yeah. for uh, Carl Barks information yeah. and uh, yeah. other zine type of things. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good, and I, I, I hope it continues to be, you know, um, supported. I don't see any reason to think it's not going to be. So it's a little extra little, you know, dot in the map for Richmond. Yeah. Before we split, uh, are you working on anything right now that you want to talk about or promote before we get out of here? Well, I, I've been working <laughs> talking about these historical novels. I've been doing a, a, a novel for I think it's over six years now. Um, it's gone through five different drafts, um, but it's a big historical novel set in 1915. It's not about comics, but it's it's a, it's called King Two. It's about a strike break uh, and a real strike that happened uh, in 1915. So again, like, oh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. The, the amount of research you have to do on these things, like 1915, I knew nothing about 1915, um, but I did want to do a novel set in my hometown. That was the, the big defining event of Bayonne in the early part of the 20th century. So I got involved in that. So yeah, I'm hopefully, if, you know, I'm on the last draft, I'm on the polished draft now. So uh, that's... Um, um, Is it a daily practice? Oh yeah. I have a, a working studio here, but I also rent a studio. Um, 
that we go to because especially I retired from DC a year and a half ago and I my great fear is that like I wouldn't leave home <laughs> it's like you know I would just stay here all day and uh, um, I wanted to get out and, you know I had a studio in Scott's edition and you'd see people and go to bars and go to coffee shops and you know now I'm over on uh, uh, Monument Avenue um, and I need to get out you know I spent all my life among students which was really you know you see people and, and talk to them all the time so I was a little afraid um, if I retired that I was just not going to see anybody uh, so that's why I have two studios but I do work every day yeah. awesome all right well thank you very much Tom this has been a, a real pleasure is there um Anywhere that people should follow you? Are you active on social media? Well, you know, I had this blog, which is still up. Uh, I put all my old stuff up, my old reviews and comics. And uh, I, I wrote for the uh, guy, I wrote scripts for a TV animated show called The Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers and put those episodes up. <laughs> uh, it was a, it's a blog called Cafe Pinfold, uh, which is still up. I don't, I don't update it anymore, but it has some cool stuff. Is the Dick Tracy piece up there? Huh? Is the Dick Tracy? Yeah, my Dick Tracy pieces. I did two Dick Tracy pieces. I did one for Nemo and then one for Comic Art. Yeah. They're both up there. Great. Yeah. Going to link to that one for sure, man. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. 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 Talking to you.